Three acts is a long uh, story there, but you caught at the end one of the important parts of that. You know how sometimes you speak loudly so someone over there can hear what you're saying more than what you're talking to the person you're talking to? And in that case, Jesus speaks loudly to the blind man so the Pharisees can hear him say, For judgment I have come into the world. If you were here last week, some of you remember we focused the whole sermon on Jesus talking to someone who was kind of growing spiritually, and Jesus said, God sent his son into the world not to judge. This week, last week, not, no wonder the church is so messed up. <laughs> I, I, I get it that context matters and that those are, aren't really contradictory statements by Jesus. They mean different things to different people. But if the only story you ever heard about Jesus was last week's not to judge, then you'd have one sense of who Jesus is. And if the only story you ever heard about Jesus was just this sentence, for judgment, I have come into the world, you would have a very different idea of who this guy is. Uh, frankly, the more I read the Bible, the more I am convinced that some people completely miss the point. Let me rephrase that. The more I read the Bible, the more uh, I understand why some people think I'm a raging heretic. Anyone else a raging heretic here? <laughs> Anyone else think that other people just are completely missing the point? That tension, I think, is really at the core of our story today, and, and it's a, what a story. Uh, two weeks ago, we had this simple story of Samantha, the Samaritan woman, who's hanging out at the well, and uh, she had one little conversation with Jesus. We pointed out that she was probably one of these people we call spiritual but not religious, and then she started to learn something about living water. We're just starting to cover that up. We're just starting to answer that question about living water, and then she starts to find a new life. And then last week, we have this guy, Nicodemus. He's a leader in his church. He might have been religious, but not so spiritual at some point in his life. But then something's growing in him, this interest, this feeling, this depth. And, he, and so he snuck out at night, and he snuck over through the dark to find Jesus and talk to Jesus. And Nicodemus doesn't understand a word that Jesus says, but there's a door open to him, to, to being born again into this new life. And so, so this week, we'll get to the blind guy soon enough. But did you ever wonder what happened to Nicodemus? After that night, he, you know, he snuck back. Did anyone catch him? Did, did he get back to his church, and he went there on, on Saturday. His, his church was on Saturday. Did he get there, and he just said, yeah, I'm just going to go back to my church family, like nothing ever happened. That conversation, we're just going to leave that one in the past and forget it and go back to status quo. It's a pretty, pretty good thought, Jesus, Rabbi, but you, know, you don't make a lot, a lot of sense, and I've got this thing kind of figured out. Or, or do you think the other option is maybe he just dropped all of his friends and his family and his church and his history and his tradition and he started to follow Jesus. One conversation might have made him into a disciple. I don't really think that happened either. My sense is that maybe he went back to his friends and his family and his mentors and the people he taught and the people on his synagogue committee and he started to tell them about new ideas he had. And he started to tell them that what, what he had been thinking his whole life just wasn't working anymore and that maybe he can help church be better. It would be a stretch if he just told them directly, Jesus has this way over here, but maybe he just kind of probed with them this new sense of spirituality, and maybe he started to use new language, and maybe he prayed to God differently, and maybe he looked out for other people who sort of believed or sort of questioned the way he believed and questioned, and maybe his own faith started to transform, and he, maybe he even tried to, tried to help other people transform his church and reform his church. And maybe he pushed them to listen to the Spirit or to be open to what God is doing next. Verse 16 in Act 2, scene, I don't know which one. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How, could, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And so they were deeply divided. Now, this is just pure speculation on my part. I have no biblical basis for guessing this, but my idea is that maybe Nicodemus was one of the ones who was defending Jesus. Maybe Nicodemus was the one who said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? Maybe Nicodemus was the one who wondered that God was standing for something new. Maybe Nicodemus was the one who lifted up the idea that God might be better than we've always thought our whole lives. Same kind of thing happens later on. Uh, Acts 5, you can read that back at home. We're going to probably read something around there on Pentecost. In Acts 5, this is the birth of what we call the Christian church. This is Pentecost going on. And Peter is brought before the religious leaders, all these big fancy guys who are probably wearing big fancy clothes. And, 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 they're, and 
they're accusing him of being unorthodox, maybe dangerous, definitely just a little off. And some of the Pharisees, they want to punish him. And some of them want to just take Peter and all these other guys and just kick him out of the church. Others, there's this guy there named Gamaliel. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But Gamaliel, in his day, was the smartest guy in any room. He was a scholar. He was wise. He taught Paul everything he knew. He was really the Einstein of his day. And Gamaliel seems a bit sympathetic to Peter and to those followers, even though he is absolutely the most perfect Pharisee there is. And he says, um, you know, consider the possibility that God might be behind some of this. At least just take a pause. Let's wait before we render any judgment. There might be something deeper going on in our faith life and how we trust God and how we might live a full and meaningful life. And again, this is just pure speculation. But what if some other night, not written in the Bible, Nicodemus snuck through the dark and found Gamaliel and said, what what do you think? My whole life I followed this rule and that rule. My whole life I've done this, I've done that. I've, I've tried to do everything just right. And now I don't know that that's what God's about. Now I'm not sure anymore. And is it okay to ask those kind of questions? In the, in the story Frank just read, there's really two conflicts going on here. We focus on one of them so much. We, uh, one, obviously, some of the Pharisees are upset with Jesus. They're always trying to get him. I mean, around every corner, they're trying to trick him into a conflict, and it's almost always a conflict between politics and faith. They try to weasel him in, to, in there. And the blind guy, let's call him Bill, because we've been giving everyone names that we're used to. So Bill, um, Bill gets caught in the middle of this conflict. And Bill becomes the excuse that they can point to in their war between religion and Jesus' radical agenda. They say, something's wrong with that Bill guy. Something's different about him. We've always known that when something is different, that's their fault. Maybe their parents' fault, but that's their fault. The poor, the divorced, the old, the lame, the women, the blind, the gays, the foreigners, the short, the uneducated, the socially awkward. What could be more obvious than if they're different, There's something wrong with them. God made that clear. Everything we've learned. And then along comes this idiot named Jesus who doesn't understand any of that. And he breaks one of the most holy rules in the whole Bible. You know which one is the longest commandment? Sabbath. Obviously God cares about that one the most. And Jesus just comes here and he ignores it. No, he doesn't ignore it. He abuses the Sabbath. And not only does he break that sacred rule, I can't tell if he's just evil or stupid, one of the two, but he did it to help one of those different people. If in that process, Bill has some dramatic change in his life, some revelation about his new life, eh, that's not really what's important, at least to some of these Pharisees in the story. His life has changed. Not just because not just of the sight, but he's joyful, and he has a purpose in life, and he wants to share it. Eh, all important things. But, by God, literally by God, there's something wrong with that guy. So how can he, who's imperfect, teach us anything about a perfect God? And besides, it's so obvious, he doesn't understand anything about God. He said it himself. And so those Pharisees fight about it. And they fight about all the bills in their world. And and, and anyone, they know it, anyone of sincere Pharisaical belief should never have to serve the bills. And they complain about Jesus, and they plot against him, because this is their last stand. If we allow that stuff to happen, if we allow our church to support that stuff, if we allow Jesus to convince people to understand Scripture in a little bit different way, what's the point of all this? This is religion versus culture, and the winner gets God. The other fight, a little less obvious, takes one verse. On one side, some folks want to classify and they need to understand and they can't really go on without an answer and a plan and the boundaries and the judgments and they like to fight and they're good at it because they have a lot of practice at it. But the others, like Nicodemus and Gamaliel, they've grown a little more comfortable with mystery and they aren't as concerned with control and they seem open to the idea that the Spirit might be moving in some new way, maybe even different ways than she's moved in the past. They tend to be better at compassion than conflict, but something is compelling them at this moment in history to stand up. And maybe this is the hardest thing to do. How to be prophetic without being precocious. How to preach the good news without being preachy. This is religious sensibility versus religious sensibility, and the winner gets... I don't know. Feels like God loses either way, doesn't it? And it feels like it just still has to happen. 
the fight still has to go on. There's two fights in this story. One gets most of the press, verses 1 through 15 and 17 through 41. You've heard about that one. Everyone sees them fighting for control. There probably were some compassionate Pharisees who said things like, oh, love the sinner and hate the sin. I don't know what that thing means, but I'm going to guess they invented it. But the ones who stood out the most of that group, the ones who kind of capture our imagination, when we think of Pharisees in the Bible, those people were just angry. And the other fight gets one verse, verse 16. We read it again. This is how I kind of imagine, imagine the conversation. That group isn't paying attention to Scripture. Oh, we, we, we do appreciate God's Word. We just understand it differently than you do. Don't you know it's up to us to maintain God's, what God's decreed in the world and God's Word? Maybe that's what you've been decreeing. And, and maybe God's sent us here to maintain peace and, and justice and, and, and loving kindness. Jesus broke a sacred rule, and you can't defend that. He gave new life. How can you not defend that? In about how many hours? In about five hours, I'm jumping on a plane, maybe six hours. I'm jumping on a plane to go to a conference. Uh, It's called NEXT, N-E-X-T. It's a group of Presbyterians who are trying their best to be like Nicodemus, to listen to God and what God is doing next in the world, and in our church, and in their faith, and how we can respond to all of that. We're a really big, wide, different group of people, so I can't speak for all of them. But many of us are motivated primarily to care for the bills of the world, and many of us are worn out fighting for them. We're just worn out. And some of us are so sick of the fight that they have decided to leave the church and let the fight go on without them. And I get that. Others of us... We don't really have a clue what it all means, but we can't help but to follow what the Spirit is doing and stand up and fight. It's it's not our job to heal or to save Bill. It's not our job to beat the other side, but it may be our job as a church that follows Jesus to remind the world clearly and loudly and compassionately, especially reminding the people who felt so hurt and, and unheard in this, that God is on your side. See, see, church, when it fights against the world, has this terrible history. It does. It has a terrible history of judgment and oppression and of forcing everything kind of from the, from the heart to the head and from the head to the paper and from the paper to the rule and from the rule to... I don't even know where God is anymore. And see, the church has been one of the worst culprits of injustice ever in the world. And we've run people off. We scared Samantha away. We we scared away Bill early in his life. And I bet every one of you knows someone in your life that has been pushed away from the church. One way or another. And at the same time, at the very same time, despite all those nasty times when the church fights against itself, maybe because of those times, church has the greatest potential in the world for community and for healing and for transformation and for peace and for justice. At the same time as all that junk, church is where Nicodemus can sneak to Jesus and find refuge and seek purpose and meaning in his life. At the same time as all that pain, faith has been and is and will be the strongest force in our world to bring things from our head to our heart, to reveal our truest selves and what we can do in a broken world. For all the bickering and the exclusion and all the failures, church may be God's answer to all that is wrong in the world. And so I, 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 I promise you that this congregation won't get it right. This denomination won't get it just right. The American religious spirit isn't going to just nail it right on, on there. Not even the Pope is going to get everything just perfect. We have things to figure out together, and my hope is that we figure them out together. I hope is that we listen to God's word, that we are open to how the spirit moves, not only spiritually, not only religiously, Not only morally, but even as how we do church. Interpersonally, how we do church and how we share God's world to a hurting world. And that is my hope today. That we can, in verse 16, find a way, even through the deep divisions, to come together as a church and listen to God's Spirit. Amen.